Okay, welcome everyone to the Flash Talk session. Um, we'll see how well this works, but the idea is that everyone will have two minutes and there'll be seamless transition between between speakers. And uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's kick this off. All right. Um, so let's. So first of all, is uh, Bizwadeep? Do you want to share your screen and get going on your two minutes? Can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Hello, everyone. I'm Biswadeep, and today I'll present my work on the heterogeneous recurrence spike neural network, the HRSNN, which consists of heterogeneous neurons with varying firing relaxation dynamics for each neuron, while the model learns using a heterogeneous HTDP model with varying learning dynamics for each synapse. Our analytical investigations and empirical results reveal that the heterogeneity in neurons integration and relaxation dynamics uh, significantly enhances the HRSN's ability to learn distinct input patterns. We show that such heterogeneity in LIF neuron dynamics increases memory capacity by capturing more principal components from input space, leading to better performance. On the flip side, we de demonstrate that the heterogeneous dynamics of the synapses reduce spiking activity while preserving memory capacity. The heterogeneity in the STDP dynamics decreases spike activation providing better orthogonalization among the recurrent network states and a more efficient representation of the input space. Finally, we show that incorporating heterogeneity in both neuron and STDP dynamics enhances the model performance while reducing spike counts. This can be further validated by this pl plot of stage values showing the global importance of uh, different heterogeneous parameters. The HRSNN model shows impressive performance on temporal classification and prediction and spatial temporal classification tasks when tested on data sets like the KTH, UCF11, and UCF101 for spatial temporal classification, and the Lorentz system and the Rossler system for temporal prediction. In conclusion, the integration of heterogeneity in neuronal and synaptic dynamics not only reduces the spiking activity of recurrent spiking neural networks, but also enhances the prediction performance. This research contributes to the broader exploration of neuro AI and its potential to bridge the gap between artificial systems and the complexities of biological intelligence. Thank you. All right, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Lizard Ip. Uh, oh, I, I, I brought the wrong person on, sorry. I said I was gonna say. <coughs> okay, sorry, Anna, go ahead. Are you ready to go? I see my slide. Uh, oh, see. Do they not see my slides? Uh, I think the screen is coming up now. Yes. Uh, that's lower. Yeah. Right now it's still black. I'll just give it a second. I'm going to pull it Okay. Yep. We're seeing it now. Go for it. Okay. Thank you. So hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here today. So uh, recently, a product has been introduced called the Spatial Computer. Uh, and uh, so there is a chance that some kind of uh, variable similar to this could actually replace uh, mobile phones, maybe even computers uh, in the future. Uh, so this inspired us, and uh, we envision a similar uh, product uh, but which would have a neuromorphic chip inside uh, executing a spiking neural network uh, with the idea to actually reduce the size and energy requirements of such device because what was currently introduced, you actually have to carry uh, external uh, battery um, uh, besides the product, saying that this is definitely uh, one of the concerns. So for this, we actually worked on a very sparse uh, deep spiking neural networks. Uh, so each neuron uh, spike network as most special impressions less than so for to the exact same performance as the uh, relu network of the same architecture. So the training here has been done uh, with a backpropagation uh, algorithm, which can then potentially be replaced with some uh, local uh, version. Uh, and more importantly, not only the performance of uh, SNN and RELU network is shown to be um, equivalent, but actually the training trajectories of the two networks are the same. Uh, 
And this has been confirmed on both a small uh, data set as well as a uh, larger scale uh, image classification data sets. So once again, the goal is now that the hardware implementation of uh, our spike in our network uh, achieves the same performance as state-of-the-art artificial neural network, but with a reduced uh, energy consumption and uh, area. So if you want to hear more detail about how we achieve this, I'm very happy to discuss in a Zoom room afterwards. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Anna. Okay. And the next speaker is Reem Malfata. Um, hi. Please give me a second to share my screen. Of course. Okay, so the subject that I'm going to talk about is uh, noise cancellation and visual processing using uh, resonant and fire neurons. So I'm pretty sure we're all like aware that SNN's uh, main building block is basically leaky integrated and fire neurons. But unfortunately, it doesn't convey all of the biological properties that um, a biological neuron has. So why not try and use another neuron that is even though a bit more computationally expensive, but not that much compared to uh, the range of uh, results that it can give us. So what we did was basically um, took uh, the input uh, from like flashing uh, LEDs with a DBS camera, a dy dy dynamic vision sensor camera. We recorded the data uh, basically at each spike. It creates uh, oscillations and according to the oscillation, we get different spikes. Using uh, these neurons, we were able to create a noise cancellation by reducing the amount of noise that were recorded around the signal, as well as uh, selecting the signals that we want thanks to these neurons. And uh, what's uh, really great about them is that first, they can also be implemented in the proper neuromorphic hardware. No problem with that. And second, it's uh, how they could also be complemented with LEAF. The goal of these neurons is not to uh, compete with LEAF, but basically work with them. So by implementing um, a DNF, a dynamic neural field network made of LEAF neurons, and connecting them, uh, connecting the output of the RF network to the LEAF network, we uh, can uh, create, um, we can uh, obtain a new output which concentrates the attention of uh, the task on um, our um, selected output. Um, basically, this is it, grosso modo. If there are like any other questions deep down there, uh, we could definitely talk over Zoom. So thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Ding, do you want to okay. go ahead? Uh, can you see my screen? Is it coming? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm seeing you. I'm very happy to present our recent study here. Uh, considering the, our first upper spike uh, is important in decision making, uh, in our study, we investigate the role of first spike of SNN. SNNs uh, when classifying real world event sequences with rich temporal structures. As we know, the fan rate focuses on the uh, number, uh, number of spikes over a given time window, ignoring spiking time information to some degree. Well, in our FS coding, um, we focus on the uh, earliest spike uh, across all the output neurons um, to make a decision. But we don't, do not constrain the number of spikes or uh, the exact spike time for each neuron which makes it more flexible to be applied to sequential data and to uh, different architectures. Overall, we use a, a supervised training framework based on a surrogate gradient learning uh, method. And uh, in the experiments, we compare the uh, first bike and the fan rate coding um, on both auditory and the visual data sites. Uh, but and we found that uh, the FS coding um, can uh, usually express more energy, higher energy efficiency than IFR coding and express distinct neuronal activities, especially for the auditory data with rich temporal structures. In addition, a longer time delay in the first spike uh, leads to higher accuracy, indicating that the first spike can encode important information. That's it. Thank you. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. So if you can stop sharing. Yeah, stop sharing. Okay. Uh, let yeah. me just stop. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. All right. Jens, go ahead. Wonderful. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks for the invitation. And thank you also to the organizers for all the work behind the scenes. It's typically um, take a lot of effort to get this thing together. And I think you can see and hear me now, right? We can. So I'm going to talk about an old dream of mine, which is start slowly starting to come to fruition. And it's luckily shared with all these wonderful co-authors, um, which is that it's very difficult to program a lot of these wonderful pneumorphic hardware platforms out there. Um, and that's not a secret, but uh, it's been very difficult to find a solution to that. And we believe that we have one way to address that problem with what we call the pneumorphic intermediate representation. And the point really is to kind of wedge near in between all these different simulators in the top and platforms on the bottom. And the point really then is to, to have a similar representation that we can translate between the different uh, platforms. And so the whole point is to kind of glue these things together, not just for, the, for taking models down to the hardware, but also in between all the simulator platforms. And so this only works if we can faithfully reproduce the computational model um, underneath. And what we've chosen to do that is an idealized continuous time model. And so here's one example of a leaky integrator. What that means is that we, are, we stay faithful to the mathematical basis. Uh, and we can take such a leaky integrator, add a threshold and a reset, and then we can try to plot the trace across the different platforms. And we see very quickly here that they roughly behave the same, which is a good thing. So we can, to some degree, reproduce a computation. <laughs> Sometimes we can't. So here's an example of um, a convolutional network. Let's see if, uh, yeah, where we are, we are comparing, uh, we're taking a similarity measure across the activity for the different platforms. And you see that some are more similar than others. And so you can say that near reproduce, this is ideal computational model, but one strength here actually also that we can expose the mismatches in the discretization schemes of the different, in this case, digital platforms. So I think that's a wonderful strength because it allows us to then do platform specific optimization if you care about very strong performance in one specific platform. Um, and so near then is not only a translation layer, but it also allows us to understand specific platforms um, more in detail. I'll just quickly mention what happens if you want to go from, for instance, a simulator like Norse to a Synthesis spec chip. You create some kind of model in Norse, and then you just create this near graph, we call it the computational graph. And in near, you can then go into Synsense from their library. So it's a very, very quick operation, as you can see. And that's really the point. We want to make it as effortless as possible to decouple the, the work done in hardware and the work done in the algorithms. And that's it. So thanks for your time. And I hope you drop by the poster and our website on GitHub. Brilliant. Thanks, Jens. Um, all right, Chris, do you want to go ahead? Can you uh, see my screen? I can see and hear your screen and you. Yep. OK. OK, so yeah, so thank you for the opportunity to um, speak about this project. Um, so this was uh, published early this year, and it's mainly a collaboration with Ron Darshan. So we were interested in um, taking this um, seminal uh, excitatory inhibitory network with strong synaptic weights um, developed by Van Ridgewick and Sampolinsky in the 90s. And what the, the typical setting is that you have large number of neurons and large number of connections to the neuron uh, with sparse connectivity. And the key feature is that the strong uh, synaptic weights and the strong inputs uh, leads to asynchronous spikings um, in these um, neurons in the model. So the first question that we asked was, can we embed recorded neural activities into these balanced network model? And the approach that we took was we keep the balanced network connectivity as is, keep it as a static synapse. And then we added plastic synapses that's sparser than the balanced connectivity. And because of this uh, sparse plastic, because it's sparse, the synaptic inputs that it produces is, uh, is fairly weak. It's of, of, of the order of the spike threshold. And after training, if we look at a trained neuron, it has these um, highly um, stochastic balanced input but on, on top of that, it has this um, uh, uh, patterned and weak uh, plastic inputs. And the sum of these two 
uh, is the total synaptic activity of a trained neuron. So it has this noisy activity, but it, it's also, uh, uh, it has this, uh, it's well patterned. Okay, and then, and then the next question we looked at, uh, we studied is, you know, how do the strong EI synaptic connections of the balanced network affect the trained network dynamics? And to do this, uh, we did what we call a subset training, where we train only a subset of the neurons and look at the, the other neurons in the network that were not trained. And we found that the, the trained activity naturally spreads to the rest of the network, rest of the neurons in the network. And we were able to verify this uh, using the neural data from the previous study by Arsene Finkelstein. We train only a subset of the excited trained neurons and look examine the activity of the inhibitory neurons that are not trained and show that we have we could have a, a, a close correspondence between the untrained inhibitory neurons and the fast spiking neurons that was not part of the training. Okay, so um, if you're interested, uh, please come by uh, to the poster. Okay, thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Chris. That looks fun. Um, all right, Luke, if you are ready, go ahead and share your screen. Oh, you're, you're muted. Hang on, let me unmute you. Okay. Is that showing? I believe. Yeah, okay, great. So hi everyone, my name is Luke. I'm a final year PhD student in the King Group at the University of Oxford. And today I want to talk about what your eyes tell the rest of the brain about the visual world. So this is usually framed as this sort of two competing ideas of one being your eyes being somewhat camera-like and compressing the visual world down as is. Or the other side is that your eyes are more crystal ball-like, so the retina in your eye, constantly predicting the future and signaling the predictive features in sensory stimulus to the rest of the brain. So which is it? So I decided to model this, and the retina is a somewhat simple circuit compared to the rest of the brain, consisting of three layers, with the last layer being an, a, a spiking layer. So you can naturally model this as a, a, a single hidden uh, layer of spiking units, and as input would be natural stimulus frames, and the output of the network would be to either predict the current frame from the spike output or predict future frames from the spike output. And this is the, the dueling idea of camera or predicting. So first question is, does the model capture or resemble the features of the retina? Uh, and this is, these are some of the core findings and in particular for the predictive model and the classic one are the receptive fields. So the model is these stereotypical receptive fields that emerge in the model as well as the mosaic-like organization. There's a, a latency-like code that emerges in the model rather than a sort of rate-based code, which has been characterized in the literature for the retina. And certain units in the model are tuned for motion, which has also been characterized in the retina. But more interesting, and back to the question, camera or crystal ball, is uh, to, to analyze this question, now that we've got a model that someone looks like the retina, is we took this model, these different models, and try to predict neural responses across different animal species, so monkeys and salamanders and mice, to natural stimuli to see which model best is able to best predict these neural responses. And what we find is that the model optimized for prediction is better able to capture these responses, suggesting that perhaps the retina is more uh, crystal ball-like than camera-like. Uh, and that concludes my talk. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Luke. And Julia, or Julia, I don't know which it is. Yeah. Hello. Um, I just share my screen. Um, so, hello everyone. Um, I'm interested in understanding surrogate gradients in relation to likelihood-based training approaches in spike and neural networks. And the problem with gradients in SNN is that they're not everywhere well-defined and almost everywhere zero. So in practice, a, a usually used solution is using surrogate gradients. When using surrogate gradients, the derivative of the um, hard threshold is usually replaced by a smooth, the derivative of a smooth function like a sigmoid. And this is usually applied in deterministic networks and works very well in practice, even in deep networks. However, it lacks a um, fundamental, like a, a solid theoretical foundation. And on the other hand, there are models that are derived from a more theoretical basis, which is likelihood-based approaches. They use the mollifying properties of noise and stochastic assonance to generate smooth um, expected outputs. 
where you can actually compute exact gradients. However, they do not really scale to deep networks. And so we were interested whether there is actually a relation between those two approaches, which would help us provide some theoretical basis to surrogate gradients. Now, looking at these gradients, you might already suspect that there is some relation in the single neuron case. But actually, already for single neurons, the output looks quite different. While being a fixed binary spike train, in the deterministic case, it is a distribution over spike trains in the stochastic case. So in general, there is actually no equivalence between them. And if you're interested in figuring out more what actually makes the difference and what are properties of surrogate gradients, or how we can still link surrogate gradients to another theoretical framework, or also how uh, surrogate gradients can be used to train stochastic SNNs, then come to my poster and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Oh, that's strange. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. Um, Ar Ar is it Ar Aradia? Aradia? Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. I am happy to share our work in which we try to understand um, how the parameters and the behavior of spiking neural uh, networks are related. I will briefly describe our approach um, and I invite you to our poster session later this evening. So there exist many models of spiking neural networks, such as adaptive exponential fire, conductance-based, current-based, and so on. They have um, shared parameters between models and also naturally some model-specific parameters, um, such as uh, number of neurons, the sparsity, the weights, different time, con time constants, and so on. Um, the idea is to sample from this parameter space uniformly at random and create a bank of millions of simulations. Um, we store these spike trains and um, compute statistics on them. So for every spike train, there is associated metrics. And this gives us uh, this forward link from the parameters to the metrics. Then uh, using a technique called simulation-based inference, um, we learn this link function, which gives us a posterior distribution of the parameters given these metrics. So in summary, not only do we have uh, a large lookup table of spiking networks that allows us to probe robustness, um, sensitivity to initial conditions, but we also have the ability to understand how um, the same parameters work in different spiking mechanisms because we um, simulate uh, shared shared parameters between models. And uh, I invite you to our post session later. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. All right. And our last flash talk of the day, because we don't have everyone who was selected, here's Oleg. Hello, Oleg. Yeah. Now let me share. Uh, yeah, so in uh, my poster, I would like uh, to discuss uh, the nature of uh, embodiment of learning inside of the uh, neural cells, what, what, what kind of restriction it has and what these restrictions may, might uh, mean for uh, learning and for uh, neural computation. So uh, uh, natural and biological neurons, they uh, depend uh, uh, very much on, on the uh, complex protein machinery depend, uh, uh, responsible for the change of synaptic weights, uh, like uh, synaptic channels or scaphoidal pro proteins. And all of those proteins have to be secreted and transported, and that's a very complex m matter. Uh, and this uh, certainly affects uh, the uh, rate of change uh, of uh, proteins and so on. So, and uh, in artificial neural networks, there is no such thing uh, like uh, in, in most models, uh, uh, researchers and practitioners, they do not use any kind of uh, restrictions on uh, the rate of change of uh, synaptic weights. So we would like to discuss uh, uh, how this might be 
uh, simulated and we simulated with uh, simulated uh, a pool of plasticity that we call and how this pool might affect uh, the uh, neural learning and computation and is it beneficial or not and uh, how we can control this pool in order to allow uh, to, to, to lead to some uh, some goals of learning here. So feel free to come to my poster. I'll be glad to discuss it. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Oleg. Um, and yeah, that's it for the flash talk session. The poster session will start now in, I think, 20 minutes. Um, so yeah, feel free to take a break. Uh, Friedman just posted the link to the Zoom room uh, in the chat here. Um, and it's also available on uh, on Eventbrite as well. Okay, great. Um, see you all in about twenty minutes in the in the Zoom room. All right, thank you. <laughs>